We've all heard about unexpected discoveries or moments we've said, aha, but do these really just come down to luck? Are scientific discoveries merely lucky shots? This is the University of the Netherlands. Maybe you've heard this fact somewhere before. The microwave wasn't invented to heat food. I don't know what you do, but that's generally what I use it for. In 1945, engineer Percy Spencer, though, was working on a high-power microwave beam. While working on this in his lab, he noticed that the chocolate bar in his pocket had started to melt. And this was the discovery of the modern-day commercial microwave. When you think about it, Spencer was really lucky to come up with his invention. After all, if he didn't have a chocolate bar in his pocket, he wouldn't have discovered it would melt in a microwave. This is what we call serendipity. Sometimes serendipity is called a happy accident. It means to make an unexpected discovery. In 1754, Horace Walpole was the scholar who invented this word. And he said, it's making discoveries by accident and sagacity of things you are not in quest of. And here, sagacity means a kind of cleverness or wisdom, really. These can be small discoveries, they can be big ones. They can set us off on a new career path, or it can be finding the perfect garden gnome for my collection in my neighbor's yard sale. Think to yourself for a moment. Serendipity happens to nearly all of us. Is there a time in your life when something unexpected made you say, aha, and set off in a new direction? Did you serendipitously meet your partner or find your job? How many of you would say you've experienced this kind of thing called serendipity? I've found serendipity happens all over the place and in many different ways. But today I will talk about how these kinds of happy accidents happen in science and about whether we can make such accidental discoveries happen more often and importantly, why that would take more than just luck. First of all, what do I mean by more than just luck? And what does sagacity have to do with it? As Walpole suggested, what kind of wisdom or cleverness makes some people more serendipitous? Let's go back a little bit. Maybe we can understand serendipity better through the fairy tale that Horace Walpole based his new word on, the fairy tale of the three princes of Serendip. These three princes from Serendip, this is a land we now know as Sri Lanka, were forced to go out and see the world by their king and father. On their way to Persia, they made a number of observations in the desert while they traveled, which became unexpectedly useful upon their arrival, where they met a camel driver who had lost his camel. Have you seen a camel on the road? They were asked. Oh, was it lame in one leg, carrying a pregnant woman with a jar of honey on one side and butter on the other? They asked. Why, yes, so you have seen it. Why, no, they answered, we have not. They explained to the confused camel driver that they had rather seen signs of such a camel on the road. By chance observation while they traveled, they saw the footprints of a lame animal and the signs of a rather front heavy woman taking a rest stop. They'd seen ants and flies snacking in the sand along the road. And from those signs, they could surmise so much about the camel who had made those tracks in the sand. Well, the camel driver thought they were liars and had them arrested. And when they were finally proven innocent, when someone else found the camel on the road, just where they'd predicted it would be, the king of Persia rewarded them instead for their sharp observations and deductive skills. The princes were not only lucky to pass by these clues, and then also lucky to happen across the camel driver for whom these clues were relevant, they were also clever enough to make the connection between what they had seen and the camel being sought. To be serendipitous, that is, you not only have to happen to come across the right thing at the right time, you also have to have the right kind of knowledge, experience, or expertise to perceive it in the right way and make that discovery. But recent research has been finding it's not only more than just luck, it's also more than just being clever, wise, or sagacious. So let's look at scientific discoveries and some inventions for more examples. 
The microwave isn't the only such discovery where luck played an important role. We know about other famous ones like penicillin. Alexander Fleming came back from holiday, saw something funny in a petri dish he hadn't bothered to clean up before leaving. Instead of tossing it out, he looked closer, did a few experiments, and set in motion the antibiotic era of medicine. Not to mention winning a Nobel Prize for his part. But serendipity isn't only about these big discoveries that change the whole world. I've found it happens all the time in science. Here's just a couple of the serendipitous discoveries that have made the news in the last year. First, sharing mice at the University of Iowa might lead to a remote treatment for diabetes. One student was studying the effects of electromagnetic fields on her mice. She lent those mice to another student who wanted to measure their group glucose levels for her diabetes study. Everyone assumed the mice would be normal as far as glucose was concerned. In fact, until the second student did her measurements, there was no reason to believe that electric or magnetic fields would have an effect on blood sugar levels or that we could help diabetic patients with them remotely. This effect was serendipitously noticed when results not relevant and not even noticed by one person were found to be really important to another person's problem. Another example, researchers had a fancy new tool for analyzing the composition of stone. They wanted to find out why the stones at Stonehenge were still standing so strong and tall. But even with this new technology, they could only see the surface layers. They didn't think there was any way they could get to the core. But a phone call from British Heritage gave them a whole new resource. It turns out more than 40 years ago, a stone had fallen. They drilled into it to reinforce it, and the engineer who had received one of these bits of Stonehenge stone had kept it all these years, and just recently donated it to the heritage. Someone there had heard about the research project and gave them a call. And here we have another example of where unexpected connections can lead to unexpected, but very valuable resources for finding the things that we are seeking sometimes. These examples show it's not just luck that leads to a discovery. It's also more than the observation and effort of just one clever person. These are examples of colleagues sharing what they notice, working together, maybe even playing with their results. Timing and luck do have something to do with it, but so does a team of equally curious colleagues, an institution that supports the research, and outcomes that happen to be useful and valuable to others. These can all be important too. It's more than luck, it's more than one moment of surprise to have serendipity in science. There's everything that comes before and everything that comes after that aha moment that everybody talks about. That's serendipity. So now that we know a little bit more about serendipity as it happens, let's see if we can make more serendipity happen. After all, it wouldn't be a bad thing to have more accidental discoveries like this. Often, they lead to world-changing new knowledge. Even the small and personal serendipities can change lives and perspectives in really valuable ways. But if we need it to be accidental, we seem to be out of luck. That is, we can't make serendipity happen, right? If we make it happen, then it wouldn't be serendipity. We saw that both the context at the time of the accident and then what people do with it once it happens are important, but we cannot force an accident. It's in the very nature of accidents that they are, well, accidental, specifically not something we can create. And if we start to expect the unexpected, then it's not really unexpected anymore. This seems to cause a dilemma. We want more accidental discoveries, we cannot create accidents. At least we can trip people in the hallway, but we cannot create the kinds of accidents we want, the ones that lead to serendipity. And it seems that so long as serendipity is really unexpected, we can't really prepare for it. So we're stuck in a bit of a paradox. But let's take a closer look again. First, let's go back once more to the princes that Walpole uses to illustrate his idea. They didn't know they would happen upon the camel driver, but they still noticed, 
luckily, the right things along the road to help them out when they did meet him in the city. Now, would we really think that's the only thing they noticed while walking through the desert to Persia? Their cleverness was shown by putting to good use some things that they noticed, even when they didn't know it would be useful to have noticed them, and then they were able to recall and put them to use when the time was right. So here's another very tricky thing about serendipity that seems to mean we can't make it happen. We often don't know at the time what will be useful later on. And frankly, we can't just hoard all the ideas, keeping all the facts in our brains just in case they would be useful. That wouldn't be very reasonable. So what could we do? We network, we trade, we share, and we're ready for anything. We have to work together if we want more serendipity. Many serendipitous discoveries come about because of interactions between people. People who knew interesting stuff, but that when put together became very interesting stuff. For example, in the 1960s, scientists Penzias and Wilson were trying to solve a problem at Bell Laboratories. Their antenna wouldn't stop making this low-level noise, and they couldn't figure out what it was. It was only after talking with researchers at Princeton who were searching for evidence for cosmic background radiation, the microwaves they predicted would be left over from the Big Bang, and the noise Penzias and Wilson were trying to eliminate from their antenna by scrubbing off all the bat poop was just the evidence they needed. Not to mention, finding a good use for their noise earned them a, nose, a Nobel Prize as well, by the way. So my work right now is really about how when it comes to research, or to serendipity in general, we need to play the long game. Short-term goals for success might be exciting, and we think we need to seize the day. But in reality, it's not just about the day. It's about all the things before. It may take a long time before we run into that camel driver, and we're going to have to be wise enough to recognize him when we do. But we're better off if we try to do this together, rather than waiting for lucky opportunities and genius observers to make big serendipitous discoveries. That is, what is needed are environments where it's not all about prediction and getting it right. It's not all about shots in the dark and high risks of individuals, but where it's about helping each other to figure out how and when to follow hunches, not ignoring the unexpected, and being open to what might be valuable about what each of us knows. Really, it's about getting excited about the new stuff we might find out together. Try to understand better how we can make serendipity happen if we can. I've been focusing lately especially on how we interact and how these kinds of exchanges can support serendipity where it happens. For example, I teach ethics and philosophy to engineers. In the classroom, interactions are the most important things. Discussions are the highlights of our time together. We get a chance to find out what each other thinks. Like when I give the class an unusual problem or a case study to think about. The best ethics lessons emerge out of these conversations, where we all discover something new about what we think by finding out something unexpected about each other or about the case. These kinds of serendipities can be thought of as a kind of action we can take together, like trying something new. So, scientists who made the big accidental discoveries in the history of science, were they merely lucky? Not quite. While chance plays a role for sure, it's really about how we respond. It is about the context. It's about who's present. It's about whether the person has the right knowledge or experience to turn an accident into a discovery. But also, we need to have research labs and institutions that encourage us to take risks together with mutual support and people who get excited with us about the possibilities that they open up. So the answer to whether we can make serendipity happen is, is really no. We can't make a particular instance of serendipity happen but we can make the world a place where more serendipity happens for more people. And I think that's a great thing. And I think looking at interactions, relationships, and networks of sharing and support are the way to figure out how.
Thank you for listening.